Ready. So just repeating for um, the latecomers, I'm recording this lesson because we've got a few people away and I'm going to pop it up on YouTube when it's done. Um, so today I am talking about the joy of you having to speak at slash with the other members of this class. Um, my goal is specifically to talk about what you can do to create an engaging presentation because that was the first question that pretty much everybody asked me last lesson. When I came around to ask, what do you need from me? A lot of people said, how the heck do I do a presentation? Um, so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So our learning intention is that by the end of this session, you'll have a working understanding of how to structure an engaging presentation. You will be able to commit to integrating a particular strategy that we talk about you will be able to have an engaging opening to your presentation and you will know how to conclude your presentation. Those are the three key things you'll be able to walk away from today knowing that you have learned. Okay, so there's a couple of reasons that we do speeches in English. So if we just peel back the curtain of the curriculum a little bit, um, one of the key reasons that I like doing speeches and what is written in the curriculum is because we just don't have time to look at every single thing that we want to study. So speeches are a really good way of getting you to look at little different ideas and present that to the whole class. So we can actually look at a whole lot of topics by giving you specifics to look at. Um, a lot of the speeches that we do in English that you will have seen last semester, the previous semester, and that you will do next semester, um, are looking at different aspects of our society. We know that a lot of our English work is looking at how does our, how does our world work, and so these speeches are to help you engage with that concept. Um, we are looking at the concept of how different texts convey different ideas, and that's a big part of this particular assignment. With the person or the place that you've chosen to look at, you're looking at a specific text and you have to explain how it's presenting that individual. That's this concept of bias. And that idea of bias is so important because once you walk out of English, once you walk out of school, you don't have anybody to tell you to be critical of what you're told. And that's really my biggest goal for you guys in English. I need you guys to be critical thinkers. I don't want you to re read or watch the news and just take it on face value and believe that's true. I want you to think carefully about it and uh, form your own opinions. It's so important. Um, of course, there are two other key aspects to us, um, assessing you guys with speeches. It's because we need to build your public speaking skills. We know students hate and are terrified of speeches. And just the fact that you hate doing them is enough of a good reason for us to force you to do them because we also hate you and making you unhappy makes us very happy. So actually the key skill that you're going to be doing outside of school is speaking to other people. And you need to be able to do that well, whether you're in a customer facing role or whether you're in a team, you're talking to your boss or you're managing your team workers, um, you need to be able to speak with other people with confidence, okay? And presentations are a strong way of building that. Of course, the best byproduct of all of this is you get an opportunity to show your personality, to show what you're interested in and show how awesome you guys are. And I know you guys are awesome because I love talking to all of you individually, um, even you. And I really love being able to see your presentations showing your personality. It's one of my favorite parts of being an English teacher. Um, so showing how awesome you are is super, super important. Okay, so that's the big picture, but what do you actually have to do for this assignment? So I need you to tell me who is the person or the place that you've chosen but I don't want you to give me a full biography. They were born in Tennessee in 1953 to two parents who also lived in a house. No, that's gonna be boring. Okay, I want you to get to the interesting stuff of why are they important? What have they done that's valuable? What choices did they make in their life that has brought them to your attention? Why do you find them fascinating? Why do you find them infuriating? Why do you love them? Why do you hate them? 
okay? Um, and then in connection with the text that you've got, how are they presented? Like, are they a really bad person, but the film you're looking at presents them as quite human, quite understandable, and you're like, oh, yeah, that was, that was reasonable, but what they've done is actually quite terrible? Um, or are they a good person being presented as a bad person or anywhere else on the spectrum? Why are they being presented like that? And this concept of bias is really, really important. I want you to be able to identify that. I want you to be able to sit back and look at the way this person is presented and think, why does the filmmaker want me to feel this way about that person? So, I'm going to give you a moment to have a quick chat with the people either side of you um, or your various personalities within your head if you're sitting by yourself. Um, and I want you to have a quick brainstorm of a few things that you like to see in speeches. We've all seen speeches that were good. We've all seen speeches that were bad. Okay. What I'd like you to do, I'm going to give you 30 seconds to have a quick think and chat. What have you seen in speeches that you really enjoyed? Um, do good speakers use jokes? Do good speakers have confidence? Do they have a good PowerPoint layout? Do they come in dressed up in costume? Like if you're doing Albert Einstein, do you come in dressed up as Albert Einstein? All right, 30 seconds to have a quick chat about what you see in good presentations, go. All right, so um, one of the reasons that we don't like doing presentations is because it's quite threatening. Um, it, it feels high risk, high stakes. You're in front of your peers who you feel might judge you. And right now, everybody's anxiety has just gone through the roof because I'm making you terrified. Um, so as a teacher, I could stand in front of a class and talk about almost any topic for hours. I could just make it up off the top of my head because I've got a lot of practice. This is what I do for a living, right? I talk at or with people. Um, but as soon as I stand in a room of other teachers and I have to do a presentation for them, say on a particular way of teaching or a particular technique or a particular topic, which I've done a number of times, I've um, presented in Tasmania, Melbourne and Sydney all about how to incorporate video games into English classrooms. Um, every single time, always got to run off and do a nervous wee beforehand. Always have the anxiety. So even though I look calm and collected with you guys now, as soon as I'm in front of a bunch of teachers, I probably have to change my pants. I also get that anxiety that you guys get. So I, I understand where you're coming from. So what is the reason that this happens? I'm going to show you this short video clip. A big part of this is this concept of stage fright. So um, this is a really interesting little idea. What it's saying is that the fear, the anxiety we feel is actually feeding us energy to help us do this well. But because of the way that we are, we feel this as being a negative when actually we can channel aspects of it to be a positive. So um, one of the questions I often get asked is, yeah, but how the heck do I start my speech? And starting a presentation is really, really important. Um, as we had pointed out when we were doing our brainstorm list, kicking off with an icebreaker can be really valuable. So there's a couple of different ways that you can open a presentation. And I would like to encourage you to use one of these couple of ways I'm going to talk about now to open your presentation. Um, you can very easily open with a direct question to your audience. And because I'm telling you, you can, you can now expect to ask a question of your audience and have the rest of the class answer it. Okay? I, I absolutely can't stand those presentations where somebody stands up and says, um, hello, my name is Mark and my topic today, not that I really chose it, I got given it, is um, Albert Einstein, and I don't really know much about him, but we're going to do it anyway. Um, they just drive me crazy. It doesn't take much effort for you to start with something like, guys, can I see a show of hands of how many people know who Albert Einstein is? Like something as simple as that 
can get a little bit of engagement, get a little bit of buy-in. It's really, really clever to do that. Um, what you're doing is making it look like you care what your audience thinks. And I don't know, maybe you do, maybe you don't. It's irrelevant. You're playing the game, trying to get them to pay attention. And everybody loves when they have their opinion asked because they think it's important. So they think you think they're important as well. It's a beautiful little trick. Um, so think about an issue connected to the topic you're discussing. Um, it can be as simple as saying, you know, has, has anybody in the room heard of Albert Einstein? Or you could say, um, I would like every person in the class to tell me one thing they know about Albert Einstein. Or say, guys, I'm going to ask three people in a moment one thing you know about Albert Einstein. Um, or something along those lines. Okay, You could even just start with, does anybody know who came up with the theory of relativity? Anybody? Anybody? And then somebody will say, oh, it was Albert Einstein, I think. Otherwise, I'm in a lot of trouble because I just use a terrible example. Um, and that's a really good way to get people engaged. Alternatively, you could start your presentation with an anecdote, something that connects you personally to the story you're going to be discussing. It shows why you're interested. So an anecdote is a short personal story, right? It can be yours personally, it can be a friend's, it can be a family member's, or it can be a moment from history that you're recounting. Um, in general, an anecdote doesn't have to be exactly about the topic, but it should be connected to the ideas you're going to discuss. So obviously I've never met Albert Einstein. Giving you an anecdote about that would be kind of difficult. But if I were to perhaps start by talking about somebody I know who's a brilliant scientist and some of the stuff they've done amazes me and I could never do that, then I could segue into saying, somebody else who was like that was Albert Einstein and he dot dot dot. Um, so anecdotes are really, really helpful for a couple of reasons. The first reason is because it puts your personality out there. People are interested in people. They want to know about each other. Um, people love stories. We are a storytelling species. We love to hear stories and we remember stories quite well. Um, so it helps to activate the memory and connect to the issue. It helps to establish your authority on the topic. If you're, if you're talking about a story, then people think you really know your stuff. Whether that's true or not is irrelevant. Okay, so it can be quite, quite valuable. Um, and of course, we get to know a little bit more about you, which gets us more engaged with what you're going to discuss. So. In order to plan an anecdote, you need to think about what is the story you want to tell and how does it connect to the topic you're going to discuss. Is it a thoughtful anecdote or is it a funny anecdote? Um, do you want your anecdote to end with a question or do you want it to end in a statement? So I'll, I'll give you an example of an anecdote um, that I should have started today's lesson with. If I were talking about the idea of how to construct presentations and how different people approach presentations differently, I might talk about that cultural aspect. And in terms of that, I might start with saying, when I was in Japan, I went over for a friend's wedding um, and I had, as you can see, my wonderful double mohawks. And everywhere I went in Japan, I got a lot of attention and everybody would point and they'd say, Neko, Neko. Does anybody know what Neko means? Cat. They, they would see my fins and go, oh, cat ears. Well, when I went to Darwin um, a couple of years after that, um, people would look at that same hair and go, ah, oh, crocodile. Yeah, it's like the fins down the back of a crocodile. Yeah. So it kind of shows the way the different people look at the same thing, but take away different information, different ideas. Um, and that's an example of how you guys are going to look at today's lesson about presentations and how to do it. You don't need to walk away with the same idea, but I need you to walk away with an idea an understanding, something that you can use in the future. All right. So that would be an example of an anecdote, right? Um, 
I could connect that to all sorts of other ideas as well. So I'm sure you don't need me to tell a story, but if you are using an anecdote, you need to keep it to about 30 seconds max. Um, so practice it, cut out all the extra details, keep it short, keep it to the point, okay? Because it's not the main thing you're being assessed on, it's just your opening, okay? So keep them short. Um, so you need to work out what is your opening sentence. You're going to skip the whole, hello, my name is Mark and, you're just gonna go straight to, when I was first thinking about this topic, I was really worried that blah, 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 blah. Or you're, you're gonna go with, can you imagine a world where, or can you imagine living a life when everybody was telling you what to do and how to do it? You, know, you need to get straight to the point, okay? Um, once you've then told your story and you don't need me to tell you what an orientation, complication, resolution, coda, all are, you then need to link into your topic. Begin the presentation proper. And that's where you say, so that brings me to the point. Or you say, guys, does anybody know what the moral of that story was? What, what am I trying to say? You know, and that gets you a question to ask of the audience, which I've already told you, you can expect the audience to answer. All right, so as you're doing your presentation, you need to keep us engaged the whole time, and that is so hard, okay? Or at least you need to look like you're keeping us engaged. Your class can be sitting there yawning, much as you are to me, um, but it doesn't matter, okay? The point is that you're going through the process. You're not being grade on, graded on, are the class being um, paying attention? You're being graded on, can you demonstrate the skills that should keep their attention? So. Um, what I would like you to do for that is to think about what have some of your best teachers done to engage your class? What um, kind of personalities have you seen from teachers? How have they behaved? How have they spoken? How have they moved around the room? And I want you to think about how can I emulate that? What did my favorite teacher in year eight do? What did my, that science teacher I had in year nine do that had us all laughing all the time, you can do that, okay? Um, so you can ask questions throughout the whole of your speech and expect responses, keeping people engaged, asking a particular question. You might say, um, so Ali, do you remember who invented the um, theory of relativity? And Ali will sit there and go, um, actually, I don't, no. Or she'll say, hell yeah, I do, it's blah. And then you've got Ali's engagement and you move on. Um, talking directly to individuals is really, really powerful. We know that if you meet somebody and you use their name in conversation about 10 times that in that first conversation, they will walk away thinking you are awesome. And the reason for that is because people love hearing their own name. Okay, it makes them feel important. So if you were to ask a question of Michael, he's going to straight away answer. And he's also gonna think, oh, that person knows who I am. That's fantastic, they must like me. And whether that's true or not is irrelevant, okay? Um, you can construct examples that use people in the class with them. Okay, probably go with your friends or the people who are around you. Um, or you could provide a handout to the class, put it um, one between three, a little activity sheet or questions to answer as you go, um, a trivia quiz or specific screenshots from the film you're discussing. And you can refer to them. You can say, okay, in the third picture on the handout, I want you to look at blah, okay? That's a really, really helpful way of getting people involved. When you are designing your slide, when you are designing your presentation, you must have examples. I need to see that you can point to moments in the text when stuff happens. So for example, if you are talking about something somebody says, I want you to write that on the slides. I wanna see the words there, okay? If you are talking about something that we see or something that somebody does, put a picture of that happening up there. You can put the, um, uh, the video clip of it happening, but don't play the whole clip, just show the moment of it happen. And, and don't ever play the trailer for the film. If you're talking about um, a film, don't play the trailer. 
I can Google that at home. Just show me the specific moment. My um, best suggestion there would be if you're showing a video, test the sound before you start to make sure it works. Okay, much like today's snafu where my videos are now not working because the network is terrible. Um, had I tested that earlier, I might have been able to avoid some of the embarrassment of, oh, my videos aren't working, how annoying. Okay, you can do the same. Um, if you are writing a quote up on the board, draw attention to it. If there are specific keywords, underline them. Okay, if you are showing an image and you want to draw my attention to somebody's body language in a particular scene, put a little circle shape around that person. Okay, so put the, the screenshot up there and put a circle around them. All right, if you want to talk about, oh, an example a lot of people will probably use is how music is used in the film to make us feel sad so that we understand how that character is sad so that we're all on the same page. If that's the case and you need to show the video clip, just drop the volume to about 50% and as you press play, talk about what we're seeing and hearing as we're seeing and hearing it. It seems like a weird thing to do, but it's a really complex skill that the vast majority of presenters really struggle with. So if you can ace that, it gets you points because it shows you're basically better than other people, which is great. All right, so I often see people presenting from their phone. And I understand why people do it. It's a very convenient little set of palm cards. But um, one of my year 12s in my, one of my other classes just yesterday was using his phone and spent the whole time looking at it and squinting like the font was really small. And every single time that happens, people stumble. And when you stumble, that crushes your flow and your confidence and it just causes more problems from there. So. Whilst I don't mind if you use your phone for notes, please make a plan to have the font large so it's easy to see, okay? I think that the best way to go about it is to have proper dot point palm cards. So here's an example of how I do palm cards when I'm doing a presentation. This is taken from a presentation I often do about um, the film Alien, when I'm talking about horror or science fiction. And how many people have seen the movie Alien with Sigourney Weaver? There is only two people of good quality in this room. Excellent. Everybody else, you're not friends with me anymore. Um, so in Alien, the aliens come out of eggs, right? But the eggs don't hatch like a regular egg. They kind of peel open. And the imagery behind that is kind of disturbing for a couple of reasons. And you can see them up on my slide there. So when I'm doing my presentation, I need to make sure I talk about certain things. So I'm gonna boil it down to simple dot points, bam, done. I can see that on my palm card at a glance. Oh yeah, I need to remember to talk about that, okay? Um, but sometimes I also forget to breathe. I just keep talking. So I'm actually gonna leave a note in my palm cards there and you can see it. Don't forget to breathe. Oh yeah, stop pause, breathe, moving on. Um, my second point there, I'm gonna talk about that particular idea. And then I remember that sometimes I just go full on flight, flight or flight, and I forget to look at my audience. I just, my head is whizzing around all the time, or I'm stuck looking at my notes. So I put a note there to look at Ruby, whoever Ruby is. I'm gonna look at her in the class so I can say that point to her, so that I can get those points for eye contact. Okay, just a really simple reminder. Um, and of course, at the end of all of that, I need to remind myself to breathe and to change the slide. There's so many times I've seen people do their presentation and forget to change their slide for like three slides. So by putting a reminder in there, you won't have that problem. Of course, I'm a bit of a klutz as well. I tend to drop my palm cards. So I'm gonna number them on the back to make sure they're in the right order before I start, okay? So this is how I would do my palm cards and you will note that they're just dot points. They are not full paragraphs. And the reason that I don't want full paragraphs is that so often I see people with their script, with their full paragraphs, just end up reading. And this isn't a, a loud reading test, this is a presentation. So I would encourage you to try to go for this, okay? 
Alrighty. So in our first brainstorming list, somebody mentioned that um, body language is really, really important. So we're going to talk about body language, or rather I'm going to talk at you about body language. So the first thing to try and do is don't hide behind any furniture. If we were doing our presentations here, which we're not, I would be worried that people would just stand here behind the computer and hide because it creates a barrier, which is safety. Yeah, so what I want you to do is try and get away from any furniture and just stand out there, kind of like I'm doing for this lesson. Um, try and stand straight. And this is really tricky. Somebody like me, I have terrible posture from decades of playing video games. Um, so it's really important to try and stand straight. And my recommendation for that is to switch on your core. And the people who are sports stars in the room will know exactly what I mean when I say switch on your core. It will hold your body straight really, really effectively. And that's a great way to get started, okay? Um, think about what you can do to engage your audience with your body language. If you're standing there with your arms folded in front of you, that tells me either that you're cold or uncomfortable. But actually this, again, the arms folded in front of you creates a barrier, okay, which is a shield. And I need you to drop that shield because that will then let you use your gestures with your hands. So, again, I can't show you this video, but when you are doing your presentation, I need you to think about how you are going to use the space. Okay, one of the assessment criteria is your use of space. Now, one of my worst habits as a teacher, and I know this because I get told it far too often, is that sometimes students get seasick because I move around a lot. Like you've seen me doing this presentation, I've moved from here to over here and back and forward and back and behind the lectern and front again. Okay, try to stand still-ish, but if you've got a bit of nervous energy, it's okay to move around, okay? Don't do the shifting your weight from one foot to the other, because that will make me seasick. Um, just kind of like you're on an, an old naval vessel. Um, Think about what you can do to move back and forward or even to come back to your presentation and draw our attention to something. Point at your slides. Point at the projection. And I'll post that video a little bit later on so that you can have a look at what that student does. Um, vocals are really important. You obviously know, you've probably been told for years, make sure you project. Um, in our classroom, um, Projection isn't too hard, it's easy to hear people, but it's really important you open your mouths and send that sound out. When you keep your mouth closed, it traps a lot of the sound. It's quite lazy. A lot of us Australians, we don't open our mouths wide when we speak. Um, so it's really important you open your mouth, you speak clearly. Don't speak through your teeth um, and think about how can you get that voice all the way to the back of the room which is probably where I'll be sitting where, when I'm marking. So how many people, when they've done a speech, have been told, don't use the word um? Yeah, a lot of people. So I certainly was. Now, words like um, so, like, and, uh, all of that, that's what we call thought words. That's when your brain is trying to catch up with your mouth. Okay, you're not sure what it is you need to say or you're thinking about what you need to say. My suggestion there is just stop talking. Okay, take a breath, think about it, and then talk. Nobody is going to be upset that you took a moment to collect your thoughts. We are all in the same situation you're in. But I'm also not going to mark you down if there's the occasional arm, um, because that's stupid. We watch world leaders do presentations and they say arm. Um. So why should I mark you down for doing that? You know, if the best in class does it as well. So my suggestion to you is if you have the occasional thought word, it's okay if it just drops in, but try to just pause, check your notes, and keep going. That's my recommendation. All right, so we are up to now this conversation of slides. And I've worked very hard to get my slides nice and beautiful and accessible. So 
IKEA's adverts are really, really interesting and are a fantastic way of designing your slides. I'm gonna talk about how now. This is not my original work, these next couple of slides, they are shamelessly stolen. Um, but there's a really interesting pattern to IKEA's slides. The images always go off the side. The most important thing is the largest and you can see a couple of little dot points and there's lots and lots of space. You're not being bombarded with information. So um, the first most important point is your slides should be visuals, not textuals, okay? Your text is only there to enhance what you say. It's not a visual essay, okay? It supports what you say, it's not exactly what you say. So just have visuals are a really, really useful thing and then a couple of words. Um, try to make sure that each slide is only one point. There is absolutely nothing worse, as you'll see from this slide in the bottom right corner, than a slide that is full of text. And I walk past classes here all the time and see some teachers' slides are just paragraphs upon paragraphs of squinty font, and it's so hard. And I find it really boring and terrible to look at. I don't know how you guys find it. So try and keep it as simple as possible. If the slide wouldn't be interesting for you as a student to look at, split the information across a couple of slides, okay? Large, clear text is best, which brings me to the next point. The less information you've got on the slide, the easier it is for me to digest. So keep the text easy to read and straightforward. None of this cursive nonsense. Don't use a fancy font because it looks awesome. Use a clear font, okay? I want to be able to see it. Make sure that the colors work well. So don't have mustard colored writing on a yellow background. I will not be able to read it. Okay, don't use red writing on a green background. It might look awesome on your small screen when you're making it, but as soon as we project it, I can't read it. So think about widely contrasting colors. Um, when it comes to your images, it's okay to have them hanging off the side of your slide. I don't need to see the whole thing, okay? As long as I can see the most important part, which for this example here is the chart, I don't need to see the rest of the chopstick, it's irrelevant, okay? It also makes your slides look a little bit neater and tidier and easy to engage with. Um, for those photographers and filmmakers in the room, you are well aware of the rule of thirds, apply it to your slides. The rule of thirds is where you imagine there are like a crosshatch over here and your slides are broken into three columns and three rows. Try and line up the information based on where those rows and columns are. Okay, so you can see an example there. All right, and don't feel that you need to fill in every single space on your slides. It's okay to have empty white space. Okay, again, it makes it just a little bit more engaging. Try to keep your theme consistent. Don't use a different color font every single slide. It gets infuriating. Don't use a different background color every single time. Don't use a different font every single time. The more consistent you are, the easier it is to engage with and the less distracting it is. Um, and then of course, here is my personal bugbear, animations. Animations are fantastic when you're in year six and you have never used slideshows before, but there is nothing worse than an animated GIF that just sits on repeat for a minute or two. Um, a couple of years ago, I, and I don't know who this was, you know the TV screens around the school? Somebody decided it'd be a great idea to have that dancing banana on the screens and like it froze on the slide of just the dancing banana. So everywhere I walked in the school, it was that bloody yellow monstrosity haunting me everywhere, dancing, jumping up and down, and it drove me spare. Yes. Mm. Where 
So it's a good question. If you find a GIF of the scene you're, you want to talk about, yes, you can use it, but I don't want to see it on screen to repeat a hundred times. Okay. So I would recommend screen cap the specific moment in the GIF, make it a still one, or keep it up on screen only for about 20 seconds. Any more than that, and it's just going to be distracting. And I'm specifically drawing this out as long as possible to make you suffer the dancing banana the way I suffered the dancing banana. I'm scarred, guys. I'm scarred. If you put a dancing banana on your slides, I don't know what I'll do, but there may be violence involved. I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> you may still get a good score, but you might also be bruised. No, that's a joke. You, I would never hurt a student, knowingly. All right. Um, so as with the IKEA one, it's okay to use just images on your slides. And particularly if you're talking about a film, you might just have the screenshot up there and that'll be it. Okay. And that's fine. That's great. Um, when it comes to other classes, if you're talking about something thematically, um, like a pachakacha or pechakucha, depending on how you want to pronounce it, just having just the images is really, really powerful. Okay. But if you are using different colored backgrounds, make sure you think carefully about the font you're putting on top of it because sometimes it's really hard to read okay so make sure again you are consistent with your font choices you are consistent with your use of space you're consistent with your order and i can read whatever text you're putting up there so that purple text looks fantastic on my small screen but up on this one it looks like dog food it's terrible okay um, and please, 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 please don't animate text. Don't have it fly in from the left and right because there's always that last dot point that you never remember to click on. All right, as you wrap up your presentation, it's really, really easy to have a boring ending. And I absolutely hate boring endings. Endings are really, really hard to do well, which is why they impress me so much when you do it well. This is your last chance to get my attention, to get points, to do your mic drop moment. So if you end with, and that's it, and then you turn off your presentation and go and sit down, I'm going to go, really? That was it? If you end with, thanks for listening, I'm going to go, it was an option? I didn't have to listen? Oh, I just wasted the last five minutes of my life. Okay? And worse, don't finish with, this is my, my pet hate, worst way to end a speech and if you do it on purpose there will be hell to pay and yeah and then you just walk off oh i hate it so much okay don't uh, I, it happens a lot it happens a lot so please 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 don't do it and please 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 don't do it on purpose just to troll me um what you can do is you can control your tone your pacing and your body language to tell me you are wrapping up with your last few statements, okay? Here are a couple of examples of how to do this, okay? You can wrap up by referring back to your opening, okay? You started with perhaps an anecdote. You can refer back to that now, okay? The, the opening statements you made and then close. Or um, you can give me a quick recap. So today, ladies and gentlemen, I've spoken to you about Albert Einstein, who was a man who did this, he did that. And in the film Blah, he's shown as blah, 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 blah. I think that this is fair or unfair, and we can learn a lot from this person's blah, 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 blah. Okay, you wrap it up there, you use your intonation to bring it to a close, and then you bask in the applause of your adoring audience. Um, you can finish with a hypothetical problem, um, which might be a little bit tricky for the topic you guys are doing, but ending with a hypothetical problem for your audience to solve can be really, really useful. So you could, for example, say, so ladies and gentlemen, I'm hoping that after our discussion of Albert Einstein today, you have learned that you don't have to be boring person who's only interested in facts. Here's Albert Einstein, one of the smartest people in history, as far as we're concerned, 
who enjoyed life, who wrung every moment of laughter and joy out of every possible moment in his life that he could. And I would like you and us all to be able to do the same. Thank you very much. That would be a great way of ending, right? Um, or alternatively, you could finish with, before I take your questions, I'd like to finish with this thought. Okay, that's a really, really good, clear statement. So ultimately, and this is the, the, the most important thing I can tell you, if you don't take anything else away, remember that with your presentations, this is your chance to show how awesome you are. As a person, your personality, your sense of humor, your, your chance to talk about how well you know this topic, okay? You guys are fantastic and we are all in the same boat. Well, I guess not me, I'm not getting graded on it, but we all feel you when you're up there and you're feeling anxious and you make a mistake. Nobody is judging you. We're all like, ooh, that hurts. I feel that because I can totally feel me doing that too. Okay, so we're all here to support you. We all feel that way. And if any of those skills that I've spoken about so far, you don't have, you need to pick one of those and think, what am I going to do? How can I do it? And ultimately, and this is pretty good life advice in general, fake it till you make it. Okay, just because you can't do it doesn't mean you can't pretend you can do it. It's the actor's mantra. Practically, I don't know how to drive a tractor, but I'm pretty sure I can work it out and make it look like I can drive a tractor. Okay, I might run over a few people in the meantime, but they shouldn't have been in front of me in the first place. Um, so your, your job is pretend like you're good at this. Pretend you're a teacher and stand up and speaking like your favorite teacher that you had in year nine. Okay, or your favorite English teacher that you had in year 12, who was incredibly charismatic and a brilliant teacher and taught you everything you know. Nobody's laughing. Why is nobody laughing? I'm very upset about that. Um, with this, I really, really, really want to see your personalities. I really want to see how much you know about this topic. And I really would love you, you guys to engage in a little bit of humor about the topic. I want you to have fun. So please try and incorporate that. The last thing I will say, the absolute last thing I will say on how to do a presentation is the better you know what you're talking about, the more confident you will be. If you talk about Albert Einstein, but you only spent half an hour reading about him, you're going to feel nervous. But if you know everything there is to know about Albert Einstein, if you watch that movie three times, if you spend a lot of time practicing, you're gonna get up and you're gonna ace it, okay? So that's why it's so important you pick a topic you know that you're enthusiastic about, that you're passionate about. Okay, don't do Tonya Harding if you have no interest in learning anything about who she is. Okay, pick somebody that you're interested in about. If you're passionate about Jeremy Clarkson being such a good guy and somebody that's worth looking up to, tell me about it. Dig into that passion. 